my colleague Allison Wassel. Uh, we bring you greetings from the Evergreen State. Uh, I don't think the founders quite had what's going on right now in mind when they called it the Evergreen State, but um, here we are. Um, we both work for an organization called the Northwest High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or otherwise known as HIDAS. Um, how many of you are familiar with HIDAS? Most of you, so I'll go through this relatively quickly. Uh, they've now hit their 20 year anniversary in terms of being part of the National Drug Control Strategy. Uh, we were designated in 1997. We were about oh, halfway into the process by which uh, Congress was designating different regions around the country. Um, they're essentially awarded the geographic global areas um, county by county. So when you make an application to NECP to be designated as a high intensity drug trafficking area, you're actually identifying counties in your region that you think meet a certain criteria. And those criteria have to do with drug production, manufacturing, importation, distribution, chronic consumption, which used to apply more specifically to different regions. For instance, the purple region is the Appalachian Hyde, uh, part of Tennessee, Kentucky, and West Virginia. And it was originally production Hyde. Essentially, families that have been moonshining for generations found that they could make a little bit of money growing marijuana. And not too long after that, they realized that they could double their profits if they also cooked methamphetamine. Uh, the problem of being a production region is that you eventually morph into a consumption region and a variety of other dynamics come to play. Uh, then you have New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Camden that are essentially consumption hives. We, on the other hand, found that we had each one of those dynamics going on. Um, those of us who are natives uh, think of our little tour of the country as relatively quiet. Uh, now that I've been in this job for these many years, I'm going to tell you that the Pacific Northwest is a hotbed of drug-related issues. Uh, we're on the international border, we're on the Pacific Rim, we have incred incredibly sophisticated transportation and communication technology, and I've come to learn over these many years that we have a raging appetite for drugs, you know, which is remarkable to me. There, there are 28 around the country, the largest are those um, light violet counties scattered across six different Midwestern states, it's not surprisingly called the Midwest Hyatt. Uh, the smallest is the Milwaukee Hyatt. Uh, no accident that there are hydas all along the southwest border. Um, essentially, the hydas were conceived of as the Colombians were dominating the cocaine trade across the, the Caribbean in the 80s. Uh, Miami Vice is true for all intents and purposes. Uh, and there were 13 federal agencies that had something in their portfolios had, having to do with drug trafficking, but they all were in their silos and really nothing was going on on a collaborative basis. So some relatively smart guy in the first Bush White House came up with an idea which is, in retrospect, a no-brainer, which is essentially to make a grant program available to U.S. attorneys as the applicants and put money on the table on the condition that the feds, states, and the locals all sit down and talk about what's going on in regard to drug trafficking in their regions and do something about it. So the first few ideas were on the East Coast and specifically in Florida. They were almost immediately effective. They drove the, the Colombians out of the Caribbean. Unfortunately, they drove them onto the Mexican land. Uh, the Colombians stood aside for a little while, or the Mexicans stood aside for a little while, but then realized that there were a few dollars to be made here. And that has unfortunately evolved to where we are today. Uh, that's our little corner of the country, uh, 14 counties. Uh, no, no accident that the counties through which I-5 runs from Canada to Oregon are part of the Haida. That's how the drugs arrive in Washington State. Uh, and it's not very well known outside of our little circle that Yakima County is one of the principal drug distribution centers in North America. In fact, more drugs come west from Yakima to Seattle than east from Seattle to Yakima. It's really actually a, a multi-state distribution center for all intents and purposes. And we're a little different than the other 27 in that we invest quite heavily on the demand reduction side of things. In fact, that's what I manage is uh, allocations across those counties to adult drug court programs, to prevention coalitions. Um, I live in an unbelievably complex, rich technological environment, so I can share resources with my partner agencies, and obviously by being here today, uh, you're aware of the fact that I do a little bit of public education and awareness. I mention this because I'm gonna talk about the law enforcement side very, of the house very briefly. They do investigative support and task force support, and in that regard, there's an information services unit, an analytical unit, and an administrative unit. And the service I'm going to talk about today is this wonderful word that my law enforcement colleagues have coined called deconfliction. Which means, in years past, the uh, Denver PD knew that a guy was stealing
drugs out of his apartment. They showed up, suited up, kicked in the door with weapons drawn at four in the morning. There were two guys inside. They were undercover DEA. They didn't know that Denver was coming. Denver didn't know that DEA was going to be there. And guys got hurt that way. So we asked all the law enforcement agencies, not just in our region, in those 14 counties, but for the entire state of Washington, to call us and register those events called critical events. Uh, we then look in, although I should back up and tell you that although the climate of collaboration based on relationships that flow out of the Haida is so much completely different than it had been in years past, they still don't share data in a particularly open way. So you can't walk into the FBI office and call up the DEA's database. But Haida's have access to everyone's data. And when we get a critical event, we go in and see if anyone else is interested in that license plate, that address, that suspect, and we link them. We simply just say, Officer Johnson, you need to call Agent Smith. You're both interested in the same target. <clears throat> and uh, there would probably be a synchrony and some uh, advantage to you working together with that. So over the years, I've asked the analysts count the critical events if they can identify each call by truck. This was the first full year of operation for the Northwest Triad. And we had a whopping total of 61 law enforcement agencies that were partnering with us at that point. Uh, cocaine was still big. The stuff called methamphetamine was coming down the road. If we had known then what we know now, we probably would have looked at that number with a little different perspective than we have. And marijuana, of course, was part of the mix. In the intervening years, things have changed. As you can see, marijuana is the green line. It's just about off the radar across the board. Federal agencies, state agencies, and local agencies have turned their attention to, clearly, methamphetamine and heroin, um, from which Washington State is not immune, as most of the other regions of the country are in the same position. So those were our numbers last year, and we were down to a whopping 237 critical events that were marijuana-related. Um, things have changed significantly. So that's an outdoor marijuana grow in eastern Washington. If you know anything about the topography and the climate of Washington, you know that it's essentially two states, the green west side and the brown east side. And as it turns out, the east side is perfect climatologically and uh, topographically for marijuana growing. Uh, and the, essentially, the eastern side of the state is covered with, with illicit marijuana growth to this day. In fact, the eradication teams are probably on the ground right now as I speak. Uh, doing their jobs. That's a, one of the more thoughtful growths. Here's the story of the eradications that have gone on since 2002. Um, 2009 was a banner year when we had the most assets and resources available to us. And the cart they are cartel growths, by the way. These are individuals who were brought from Mexico, trooped into the backwoods, in some cases without even paths or roads. Um, set up a living situation that they will inhabit for four months, in some cases, and go about the business of growing marijuana, and then harvesting it later. Um, that 573,000 plant total, which again was simply that which was eradicated as opposed to accounting for everything that was going on out there, is over a billion dollars worth of weed. So as Initiative 502 was coming down the road in 2012, people were saying, well, when we legalize, it's going to do away with the black market. And I have to assume that it would be really hard to turn tail and walk away from a billion dollars a year. Uh, and it really hasn't happened in any significant way. And, and we're beginning to see an uptick again. Um, we're typically second, third, or fourth in the country, everyone else behind California, in terms of the tiny inch and the acreage that's involved in our outdoor growth. This actually is predated by the dynamic involving high quality weed that's been impacting Washington State. 30 years now, really. Um, BC Bud, if you remember that, uh, predated this by about five years, mid-90s thereabouts. That was one of the first organized efforts, at least in North America, to improve the quality, improve the quality of marijuana, both in terms of its, uh, the manner in which it thrives in different environments, and the amount of THC it produced. So BC Bud was the first real effort on an organized basis to change potency and change the quality of the marijuana that had historically been available. Um, apparently, growers in Washington State so, took some umbrage at not being involved with the production of the best marijuana in North America, so 
a process began whereby people began to follow the uh, template that had been put together in British Columbia and start growing really good weed. Um, so it's not as if Initiative 502 introduced marijuana to Washington State by any, any stretch of the imagination. And this is part of the puzzle. This is an unbelievably busy <laughs> slide that my friends at the Washington State Patrol put together every year. Uh, the red counties are where the most eradication activity went on last year. And it, it moves. Um, and essentially, the two important players here are the Yakima Indian Reservation and the Colville Indian Reservation, which cover, in each case, four or five counties, or pieces of four or five counties. And much of that's undeveloped, uh, much of it is uninhabited, and again, it's perfect growing uh, country. That's an aerial shot. You can't really find these things at foot. Uh, this is an aerial shot of an outdoor grove. These guys were very smart, um, pretty easy to see. Uh, in fact, they use folks who are colorblind, because for those of us that can see full spectrum, it's kind of hard <coughs> to discern the different shades. Someone who can't discern greens, this is a grayscale picture, and the marijuana is significantly looking different than the uh, foliage that's natural to the area. Here's an indoor grow. This is a tier three grow in King County. This is only part of it. Tier three grows at 30,000 square feet uh, up to that. Um, and this is now the defining characteristic of what's going on in Washington. Very briefly, um, for comparative pur purposes, this is the lovely state of Colorado. The red states, or red counties, are locations where commercial activity is not allowed. Now, I know full well that everybody can grow their own in Colorado, but um, I was taken aback when I first saw this to realize that the majority of the state is not on board with commercial ads on marijuana nor is the majority of Oregon, for that matter. Although, <laughs> this is a moving target. Oregon keeps revisiting their issues. I think there have been two, three elections maybe where counties and municipalities have had an opportunity to either opt in or opt out. So I believe the county in which Bend and Redmond are located in Central Oregon are now commercialized at least to the extent that they have retail stores. Uh, but by and large, it's a Western Oregon Willamette Valley activity. And recently, Massachusetts, Massachusetts got on board, and the counties that are really moving forward are the green counties. So they're not overwhelmingly supporting the commercialization of marijuana there either. Nonetheless, that's the lovely state of Washington. And there is one change to that. The yellow county up in the northeast corner is now green. So we essentially have five out of 39 counties that at least on paper, do not allow commercial activity. However, three of those counties include cities that have passed ordinances that allow for commercial activities. So only two, two of our 39 counties have prohibitions in place. The rest of the state's on board, full board, pretty much everywhere. Here's a little update. Um, the Liquor and Cannabis Board in our state up updates its data every Wednesday. This is unfortunately about two weeks old, but relatively recent. Um, most cities are uh, in the game, as I mentioned. Uh, 37, essentially, counties are in the game. We now have 495 stores. We have a legislative uh, limit of 556. We'll probably get there sometime in the next few months. We have 1,166 producers. 1,191 processors, many of whom are uh, dual licensed. So those aren't 2,200 individual businesses. Those are businesses that in some cases are licensed to uh, conduct both sides of the, the house. Um, daily sales exceed $4.5 million. Today, $4.5 million worth of marijuana will be sold in Washington State. Uh, we're, close, we're closing in on a billion dollars in sales <coughs> per year. We're generating over $200 million in taxes a year. Um, we, as a matter of fact, because in our scheme, <coughs> marijuana stores are part of the retail sector uh, that includes um, similar kinds of stores. And of course, the retail apocalypse is happening across the country, right? Everybody's buying online, and a lot of brick and mortar businesses are going out of business. Not in good old Washington, because the marijuana stores are essentially buoying that entire sector. And they actually saw a 6% uh, growth, of which more than 25% was due to marijuana sales. And now 
I will turn it over to Allison. This is the second volume of a process that uh, started 15 months ago or more with our first report. Um, essentially, it's entirely archival um, data. Um, it is as objective as we could conceivably make it. And Allison will share some of the headlines with you. Hello, everybody. Um, I always have to give this caveat before I do presentations. I talk fast. I get excited. This stuff is like kind of my little baby. It's my little pop baby. So I'm very proud of it, and you guys will see that excitement. So caveat in addition to that, if I say something a little bit too fast, I say something that doesn't make sense, or I use a funny word, because I tend to do that at times, please raise your hand and just ask me. Um, more than happy to do that for you guys. Um, these reports are, you know, you always hear the term, the tip of the iceberg. This is like a snowflake maybe making its way there. There is so much information and so much that goes into any impacts in which are going to be felt within a state, within these communities, that this is our best way to collect that baseline data and give a sense of what's going on within Washington. So when we were tasked with writing the first report, you know, we needed to have some sort of methodology for how we we're going to construct this impact report. So these were our four goals. They were plain, they were simple, and they were what we wanted to achieve. It needed to be an impact report, obviously. It needed to be a descriptive snapshot of what Washington State was and what it looked like. It needed to be a regulatory overview of what this whole legalization actually meant, what does it mean for who, and what can we expect in the future. And lastly, pull some literature, current and valid, on the issue, again, to kind of give that snapshot, to give the impacts, and make it objective as we move forward. From that, we put it in 10 sections. And these were our sections in which we really wanted to hone in on where these impacts were felt. Not only for a law enforcement community, but for public health and anybody within Washington State who wanted to pull up a report and read it just to get an understand of what the lay of the land looked like. So we cover anything from a legal to a regulatory overview, youth and adult impacts, we'll do impaired driving, diversion, and marijuana related crime. We go into environmental impacts and current and upcoming markets. So we'll start with section one. Steve and I always, when we give presentations and such, we'll do normally a full breadth on what our medical marijuana market looked like, but because of time, we can't do that today. There's so much that has happened since we passed in 1998 that it's just its own monster and its own beast. So if I mention something today, or Steve and I mentioned something about our medical market that wasn't covered, please come up to us and talk afterwards because it's its own novel on its own. But for historical purposes, we passed it in 1998 through I-692. And at that time, our state was, oh, thank you. So, um, so in that sense, uh, we passed it. And at that time, it wasn't set up to be a commercialized market. It was for a very small group of individuals within the state with very specific uh, qualified conditions, such as cancer and AIDS and wasting disease, so they could get what they needed on the treatment side of the house. Now from 1998 into that third bullet, 2015, it went through ups and downs and changes. It was exploited, but up until 2015, it was just this giant gray market that was its own unknown because it had no regulations and it had no rules surrounding it. So in 2012, when we passed uh, recreational marijuana with I-502, this was a very first chance for us to walk away from that gray market and build a recreational market from the ground up. This was going after licensing, zoning, possession, anything that was to create an entire system, that's when it started. So in 15, when we passed Senate Bill 5052, we could loop in a gray medical market and have it mirror a lot of the regulations and guidance and policies that we'd already implemented for recreational markets. So now within Washington State, they're under the same umbrella because it was not as how it should have been operating back in the day. Now, those three uh, monuments and landmarks of our history within marijuana were all under the guise of all the federal memos that came out. So in 2009, you had the David Ogden memo, and that applied to medical marijuana. And those are enforcement priorities for prosecutors across the nation to say, if you have medical marijuana within your state, you need to focus on these areas to make sure that these crimes aren't happening. That again was mirrored with the Cole memo in 2013, and the Monty Wilkinson memo in 2014, which was for federally recognized tribal um, sovereign lands and nations. Washington has any number of uh, 
Indian sovereign lands in different nations, and Steve and I had already mentioned, you know, Yakima and Colville, and so this was an opportunity for those in, those organizations and those uh, those peoples, if they wanted to join, they could, and these were the areas in which they needed to focus on and make sure that these weren't happening. So we go into section two, which is our regulatory overview. Again, we, we uh, pass the legalized marijuana, we have recreational marijuana, what is it gonna look like, whose responsibilities for it, and what is it gonna be? Our Liquor and Cannabis Board, which we do have members here, I'm actually very happy that they're here within this conference, they are the regulatory authority. They do all the guidance, they do all the licensing, they cover product rules, industry guidance, legal recommendations, and regulatory enforcement checks as well on all of our businesses within the state that fall within a recreational or a medical guise now. I apologize for these numbers being small to those in the back, so if you need to see anything, please let me know. But these are data, so as Stephen mentioned with the updated number of licenses, these numbers are only as good as the beginning of 2017. So what you see here is that down on the bottom of this graph, we have all the different types of licenses that you can have within Washington State. You have your producer who's a grower, your processor who's your manufacturer, and your retailer is the one who's selling the products. And then Stephen mentioned as well, you can be a grower, a producer, and a manufacturer, a processor, within one license. So at this time, when I pulled data, we had 2,500 licenses issued within our state, but they made up over 1,600 businesses because of those duly held licenses. And our producers and processors are about 58% of the industry at that time. Now that is also in part because we do have that licensing cap of 556 stores, and producers and processors are just the ones that make up the majority. Licensing violations, um, within our Washington State Administrative Code, there are civil penalties that can be um, given to these licenses if they're not following the rules and the guidance and the regulations that have been imposed for them to follow. And they're broken up into four categories. So group one is violations against public safety. You have group two, which is your regulatory violations. Group three is license violations in general. And group four is for marijuana producers and processor violations specific to those two licenses. When we pull and analyze this data, in group one, you have 93.6% of violations um, involving minors. And now this is anything not only from a minor going to a retailer who is purchasing product, but it could be a minor on a premise or an <coughs> underage employee as well. In group two, you have 40% of those violations are for failure to utilize and maintain traceability. That is what the foundation of any legalized industry is built on, which is your seed to sale. So you have 40% of those licensees within our state that have some sort of issue and have been dinged for not following the rules. And in group three, you have 32% of her true party of interest violations, and this is all about hidden ownership. You have corporations that are involved, you have LLC that's, uh, that are involved, um, financiers that are involved that shouldn't be involved and they're being hidden, and that's where they're getting dinged again as well. And that applies to all licenses, your producers, your processors, as well as your retailers. And production. And Steve had mentioned with our, uh, our grass for our outdoor grows, we've been up to our earlobes in marijuana within Washington State since forever. Um, and now we're doing it in a kind of a re uh, recreationally system. And so in 2015, after our first year of commercialization, with all the licenses that we had had at that time, we harvested about 60,000 pounds of marijuana. Fast forward to the next fiscal year, you over a quarter million pounds of marijuana, which is a 281% increase alone. Now that is also due to more licenses entering into the system and people honestly mastering their craft when it comes to growing marijuana within the system. You can have growers that are from zero to 2,000 square feet or all the way up to 30,000 30, 30, square feet um, within our state. So if you go into these grows, they look like a Costco. They've got all the steel, they're just growing like it's nobody's business, they've got their own system, and needless to say, they're growing a lot. In addition to you know, just usable marijuana within the state, we have infused products, and this is a hot topic item, not only for within Washington State, but across the nation. You know, What are these infused products gonna be? How are the rules gonna be around it? What are we gonna do? Our Liquor and Cannabis Board actually has a panel that is responsible for approving these products before they hit retailer shelves. So a process, you can't just go, I wanna make popcorn and then put it on a shelf. It's not allowed. It has to um, pass packaging, it has to pass that the THC has been evenly distributed, has to make sure it's not appealing to children, all of those things before it gets a stamp of approval to move forward. Now, that list that gets approved to go forward is actually publicly accessible, and what we did is that we'll analyze the data and we broke it up into these categories. So you have baked goods, desserts, 
candy, snacks, liquid form, and miscellaneous items such as like a tincture. And what you can see here, the vast majority, 31% is falls within a desserts category, followed by 20%, which is candy, and then in baked goods. Now, when states go to legalize, you know, you're like, okay, so they're gonna have infused products. This is what somebody would, I guess, normally think of, right? You got brownies, chocolate, cookie, and those are gems or pebbles or jewels, and that's what they used to call them. But that's kind of what comes to mind, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that they've definitely expanded. This one right here, that's tomato basil infused soup. You have hot cocoa mocha mix. You have cannabis sugar packets. Up in the top, those are cannabis infused breath strips, like those little Listerine things. Nope, you get pop them now. Um, you've got almonds with cannabis, you've got drinks, you've got the fruit snacks, you've also got honey sticks. It doesn't stop there. At the very top, you have a pumpkin spice flavored vaporizer, which is festive given fall time. Um, you've got tinctures, you've got cannabis and sugar pita chips, you've got catapult coffee pods, which I've been told fit in most Keurigs. Um, you've got transdermal patches. These are hot chronic spoons. So what they market towards is that it's a spoon dipped in with obviously with chocolate. You're supposed to put it in milk and stir it around and boom, you have infused hot cocoa. You've got Moxie Mints and Can of Kiss Lip Balm. Mm -hmm. The big thing here is that, you know, you had an industry that was so closed off for so long. Now it is in a, a legalized realm and the novelty is there. But with novelty comes issues because this is not what we're seeing. That looks like a candy gem. That's a Rice Krispie treat. And that just blatantly says hard candy. Biggest issue here is youth, and it'll always be youth. Now, we will talk about this later, but these little labels down here at the bottom, our Poison Center in combination with our Liquor and Cannabis Board in combination with the numerous uh, state agencies across the state, did recognize that youth getting in their hands of marijuana is a bad thing and we need to make sure that we're reducing it. So not only is it within child resistant packaging, but the sign there is a red little hand that says not for kids and it does have the poison center's number on it. So if an unfortunate situation does arise where a kid's gonna get their hands on it, you at least have a line of service there to get what you need. However, most kids probably aren't gonna read that and they're gonna reach right in. So, Caveat two, youth impacts. In our state, they do a biannual survey called the Healthy Youth Survey, and this gets distributed to all school districts across the Washington state that are in sixth, eighth, 10th, and 12th grade. And they ask them any number of questions. They kind of fluctuate over the years, but obviously, for example, 2008, this is a question that's always been asked, which is good data to pull from to kind of see what's going on with kids within our school and within our state. So based on the 2016 data, we had 41% of 8th graders, 45% of 10th graders, and 52% of 12th graders who admitted using six or more times in the last month. And then among 10th graders who used marijuana in the past 30 days, nearly one in three used 10 or more days in that month. And then we talk about perception of harm and perception of risk for kids. Again, we're able to go back to 2008 and see how much things have changed. So perception of harm during the 2016 survey, you have 43% of eighth graders, 60% of 10th graders, and 72% 70, of high school seniors who do not think that you know, marijuana is a low, a low or no risk in using it one or two times. And this was the cause for alarm. These were words that were used from those who administered the Health Youth Survey themselves. More kids now are getting involved with marijuana and having uh, are engaging in behaviors that are more risky than with alcohol. So more than half, you have 51% of your high school seniors who reported using marijuana in the last 30 days have driven within three hours of consuming. It's just a call that we, you know, the education needs to be out there and the awareness needs to be out there for kids because not only are they not supposed to have their hands on it, they're not supposed to be behind the wheel of it either. The Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction their office every year has to submit a report to the United States Department of Education on any number of issues. For here, we're gonna focus on suspensions and expulsions as it pertains to substance abuse. So we're not gonna talk about bullying or any other crimes or incidents that happen within schools. It'll just be substance abuse. So that is what we're looking at here. For suspensions from 2014-2015 school year, you had 49% of them were involved with marijuana 
which was an increase of 6% from the previous school year. With expulsions, you have 60% of expulsions within that substance abuse category were related with marijuana, which was a 12% increase from the school year before. Now, the caveat to this is obviously each school district is gonna have their own policies on how they handle these types of issues, but these are at least incidences that are happening, it's being reported, and it's increasing. And our poison center. So again, these are incidences where children are getting into marijuana, but this is also adults that have maybe indulged just a little bit too much. So from 2012 to 2016, we had calls, in, calls increased almost 80%, and then from 14 to 16, they increased another 20%. And again, the caveat to this is we legalized in 2012 and things have gone up, right? Well, one of the cultural things that could have been accepted is that people just feel more comfortable to call. You know, they don't feel like they're gonna get in trouble anymore, or now the awareness is out there that Oh, if I actually don't feel good, I can call the poison center and they can help me out for what I need to do. Regardless of, we're seeing what's actually happening, the calls are coming in, and this is what we're looking at. And needless to say, as our reports move forward, this is something we're diligently looking at. What also we're looking at is how it pertains to kids. This was uh, from the 2016 data just this past year. Exposures in children zero to five years of age 73% actually occurred in those one to three years of age. A one to a three year old child doesn't know any better. They're just gonna pick it up, put it in their mouth, and you know, move forward. Um, again, this is how it prompts for education and warnings to go out. So that is a sticker that we saw on the infused product. That sticker does have to be on every infused product that gets passed within the state. But not for usable, not for concentrate. So that is a caveat too. It's a step in the right direction, but obviously still kids are getting into it. Treatment admissions. Um, there could be any number of reasons why treatment admissions are going down in any sort of state. Is it financial reasons, number of beds are going down? But the one thing you look at here, marijuana has always been number one in our state for why youth are seeking treatment. It was 60% of admissions in 2010, and it was 71% uh, of admissions in 2010. Is this substance use disorder counseling treatment or is this emergency department treatment? So this is inpatient, outpatient, and then we have chemical dependency. Yes, yeah, so there's a whole bunch of, yes. And our adult impacts. So the Young Adult Health Survey, this will actually go out to those 18 to 25 years of age. So our legalized age within our state is 21, so you're getting a group of individuals that are just below the legalized age and ones that are above the legalized age but we're looking at their use patterns. And again, this is just information and kind of describing what the use is within our state as it pertains to this population. So between 2014 and 2015, you had a 3% increase in those who reported using at least once a year, which could be experimental since we are a legalized state, but you had no change in use for once a month, you had a 2% decrease in once a week, and then a 1% decrease in daily use. But what's interesting to look at is the sources for these young adults. Again, a little under the age and a little above the age. But if we break it down for what their most common source is, it's actually from their friends. So you have 76% of those the age 18 to 20 are getting it from their friends, and 55% of those 21 to 25 are getting it from their friends too. Now, for that group above the legal age, they are getting it in the store as well. That's the second most common source, but it's still being handed amongst one another. Unimpaired driving, and this is a giant public safety concern for anybody who does smoke, doesn't smoke, whoever's just on the road. So we pull information from our Washington State Patrol Toxicology Lab. Our lead toxicologist is amazing. She's phenomenal. She always posts information. She's good about you know, passing it along just to make sure that we are in the know of what's happening within our state and what's happening on our roads. So you'll see the very first column in the blue, that is the number of cases that are just positive for Delta 9 THC, so the active cycle, active component of THC, regardless of the level. The middle graph is the number of those cases where it was below the five nanogram per milliliter of blood, because that is our DUI threshold for marijuana. And then the last one is actually those cases that were above that five nanogram limit. And what you can see is that the number in blue, the number of drivers that have that, that active psychoactive component have been going up since 2012. And then your number of cases where it's below or just a little above, and then same with where they are. And so 2002, for comparative purposes, you got 62% of cases were at or above the DUI limit, 
to 38% of cases now, which sounds like it's gone down, which is good. However, you're still having more drivers testing positive now for that active psychoactive component than you were before legalization. So again, is that more treatment? I mean, more education awareness we need to get out there for drivers? I mean, what do we need to do to get this risk off the road? So in 2012, it was only 18.6% of drivers that had that active component, and now you're 33.6% of drivers actually testing positive at some level of that active component. The AAA Foundation, yes sir? Was that in fatalities? Was that in that's just a DUI. So if a trooper pulls you over and I'm going to pop you for DUI, that's what it's coming back with. So it's this is the, so this one, this the AAA study. This will be fatalities. This is for any driver. They're also finding that with alcohol DUIs, it's always predominantly an evening or nighttime event. With alcohol DUIs, daytime mostly across across the board, 24 hours a day. So there is no with marijuana. With, I'm sorry, with marijuana. So there is no diurnal difference mm -hmm. in the incidents. So on the fatality note, AAA Foundation they pulled data straight from our Washington State Traffic Safety Commission and analyzed the number of fatalities from 2010 to 2014. Now in 2010 we weren't a legalized state on a recreational scale, but in 2014 that was two years after we had legalized. And 2014 is when our commercial sales had started. So that was the years in which they pulled from. What they found was that obviously THC and alcohol were your number one giant group of individuals that were, uh, were the compounds that were most common within those fatal drivers at a rate of 39%. THC alone was next to 34%. But if you take those drivers, 10% of them involved in fatal crashes between that date and range had some sort of level of THC in their blood at time of crash. Yes, sir. Can you comment on any um, changes in how often or how likely they are to test somebody for THC since legalization? Have they changed their enforcement policies? No, so everything's a blood draw in our state. So they'll run a full panel and then just see what it comes back with. Okay. So, the, the, yes, sir. Uh, along those same lines, mm -hmm. um, when we studied this in Oregon, we learned that 60% of our fatalities So, um, okay, so are you, uh, that since changed um, just recently. Okay. But are, in Washington, are you guys testing all fatalities or? I, no? I believe so. I don't, I don't know. So. Yeah, I don't think that they, they're really on it when it comes to this information. I know they work, AAA worked really closely with our Traffic Safety Commission, so I'm almost, I'm pretty positive there because it's going to be a continuous study that they're running too. And, and this issue also bears on the changes in enforcement and attention that's given to the issue on the road. So you have to take some of this with a grain of salt, knowing that the enforcement activities that are going on the freeways and roads is significantly different now than it was 10 years ago with regard to marijuana. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no way to parse out how much raised attention is playing into this as opposed to just the incidents of people that have been using marijuana. Yes, and we always just like to conclude this because this is why we care. You know, being in a public safety forum and career, you want to minimize risk, you want to minimize harm, you want to keep your community safe. And this was an incident that happened in 2014 where a 19 year old driver had just got done smoking marijuana, blew an intersection, no skid marks, hit a local pastor on his bike, cleared him across the intersection, and he was dead on scene. One is too many. So, this is how we need to push for education. We need to push for awareness to make sure that these incidences don't happen, you know, again, once too many. Section six, diversion. Again, another hot topic item. Um, the information in which we pull from the national seizure system is up for a lot of debate. And there are a couple reasons in which for that. Um, first and foremost, if you get a South Dakota trooper who pulls over somebody from Washington State, they've got marijuana in their car, boom, marijuana seizure. But the questions lead, well, did it come from a recreational store? Did it come from one of our dispensaries? Was it somebody who was just growing in the house when they shouldn't have been? Was it from the black market? Was it a cartel? All of these types of questions come up. However, that South Dakota trooper just knows it's green, it's stinky, 
and test positive for marijuana, it's above our limits, it's above our laws, and he's transporting it over federal state borders, that's a seizure. That is our methodology for this. The reason how we know there's a nexus to marijuana is because it's a driver that has a Washington State driver's license, their own admission, they're in a car from Washington State. Normally when they're gonna get popped for this stuff, they roll over pretty easy. So from our inception of our legalization in 2012, our marijuana was um, destined to 38 different states within the U.S. And what's interesting is if you look at this data over time, it's the same states that keep kind of popping up over and over again. So these are systems in which we always know it's going to go to Atlanta, we know it's going to go to Florida, we know it's going to go somewhere in the Midwest. Um, now, we obviously have leakage in our state. Can we point the finger at the recreational system? Can we point at the medical system? Can we point at the black market? Nobody knows, but something is getting out. It's also going through the mail, though, a lot. Um, and we got information from our uh, United States Postal Inspection Service who are inundated with this. They have a locked area in their office in which they hold all this stuff. You walk back, you get punched in the face with the smell. I mean, it is just everywhere. So we were able to pull information from them from fiscal year 14 through fiscal year 2016. And again, this is something that they're continually working on within our state because, as Steve had mentioned, Washington State is a giant hub for getting this stuff out, and we're growing really good weed. So from 14 to 15, you had a 58% increase in partial seized, as well as 153% increase in pounds seized as well from those packages. And from 15 to 16, you saw another increase of 60% in number of parcels and 80% increase in pounds seized. So what that means, so if we look at fiscal year 2016, we had 441 parcels seized out of the Seattle area that were almost 1,400 pounds of marijuana alone. I mean, these are little bad, you know, we might have a couple pounds in one box or 10 to 15 pounds in another, and it's just going out. Again, we don't know who's shipping it. Again, is it recreational grown? Is it medical? Is it a cartel? Is it somebody who's just growing it and they shouldn't be? Bad, don't do it. We don't know, but again, there's leakage, it's getting out, and it's still continuing, and it's going out. Section 7 is our marijuana-related crime section. Again, going back to our Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, they're doing some amazing things down there, but this is where things get kind of weird and kind of confusing, so bear with me. Before we legalized, so in 2012, cases that were sent to our crime lab only were submitted for qualitative testing. So was this green stuff marijuana? Yes or no, that was it, and they could move forward. Once we legalized, there were THC percentages attached to different types of products. So now they needed to do quantitative testing to actually assess where those levels were. So we didn't have in 2012, and then in 13 and 14, they applied those quantitation cases to adults and to minors. However, they realized with minors, they didn't need to do quantitative testing anymore because minors shouldn't have marijuana anyway. So if it's marijuana, boom, they're done. So then they switched back to qualitative testing just for the minors. Quantitation cases are now just for adults. Clear as mud? Sweet. So, that's why this looks funky, that's why there's only two, and there's kind of three, but again, this is just us collecting baseline data to assess what's going on, what's changing, and what's to come. So for 2016, we had 889 cases that were sent in for that qualitative testing that minors made up the majority of those cases per the crime lab. Pierce County Sheriff's Office. Um, this is a county just below King County where Seattle is housed. So if anybody's familiar with Tacoma, it's my hometown. This is where Pierce County. So they collect data and what they'll do is that they will take the current year and compare it to the previous years, it's like about four, to assess is it the number of incidents that we see, are seeing now, is that normal with what our normal range has been? Are we above where we are or are we about where we should be? So if we take a look at incidents related to the sale and manufacturing of marijuana in a legalized system, so we shouldn't be having incidences outside of that recreational scheme, they've seen a 31% increase alone in 2015, followed by another 12% increase in 2016 for those incidences. And these, again, are just people that shouldn't be growing outside of the recreational system. These are people doing it on their own. Our environmental impacts. So Steve had mentioned with those lovely pictures, which are so cool to look at from a marijuana eradication, this is looking at data from 2011 through 2016 of what our seasons looked like. So what you're seeing here is a number of plants by the land type. 
So you've got private land, you've got Bureau of Indian Affairs land, Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service land, National Public uh, Service land, and then state land. So it kind of jumps all over the map. If you take all of that in from 2012 when we legalized to 2016, we had almost 375,000 illegal marijuana plants were eradicated during that time. If we look at just 2016 alone, 60% of those uh, illegal marijuana plants were on state and public land. That is a violation of the Cole Memo right there. There were almost 60,000 plants during the last year's season, and per about 120 day cycle is what the plants were growing at outdoors. And per what they found on scene with all the illegally diverted water, they assessed that it, from those 60,000 plants, it made up uh, 42, $43.2 million dollars water um, that was used to supplement the growing of those plants. Department of Ecology has recently hopped on board with our eradication teams as well, because not only where do you find plants, you're gonna find chemicals, you're gonna find herbicides, you're gonna find pesticides and a bunch of other nasty stuff. So to keep our law enforcement guys safe when they go into these grows, they're bringing in the ecology team to assess and make sure everything is safe. So this past season, um, going out to a grow, they actually found uh, fear damp. It's a neurotoxin to humans that actually sent California Forest Service guys a couple years back to the hospital. It is nasty stuff. We found it in the grow last year. We also found a little over 400 pounds of additional pesticides, herbicides, and chemicals in these grows. Now, not only is Department of Ecology going in and assessing to make sure the land is safe for our officers to go into, they're also doing environmental studies, taking soil samples, water samples, and assessing what the damage is from the diverted water, from them setting up their camps, from all the propane cylinders that they're bringing in. They just implemented this last year. I'm nerdily excited to see what data they're gonna keep pulling as years to come. But again, this is where we're at, and we're proactively collecting data to see what these true environmental impacts are gonna look like with years to come. Yes, sir? Do you have to collect impact from legal um, From our HIDA stance, no. So I, in my role, I'm not going out to legalized individuals to have those types of conversations. Am I collecting data and assessing it other ways? Yes. Um, I know Liquor and Cannabis Board would be more so the people in which to talk to on that, or our Washington State Department of Agriculture as well. They are all very well inundated with that to assess and make sure that things are safe and should be running the way that they should be. Section nine, the current markets. Hey, guess what, guys, we're almost there. Woo. Okay, so our recreational medical marijuana sales. So what you're looking at here is just sales from fiscal year 15, 16, and 17. Obviously, 15's on the bottom. We increased the fiscal year 16, and then preliminary data through 2017. To put numbers to those years, in fiscal year 2015, we had about $260 million in sales, which bumped up to $972 million in 16, and about 800,000 so far for fiscal year 2017 when I pulled the data earlier this year. And our excise taxes keep bumping up too. So for fiscal year 2015, we had about 65 million uh, excise taxes collected, which bumped up to 185 in 2016. And then in 2017, again, preliminary data, was a 271, which was already over what 2016 was, right? Well, that was because our, our taxing structure changed. When I-502 was originally passed in 2012, the taxing scheme was 25% at each level of the system. So as it moved from a producer to a processor, processor to a retailer, retailer to a consumer, 25% tax was included. In 2015, when we integrated that medical system in with our recreational system, they changed it, and now it's 37% at time of transaction from the retailer to the consumer. And needless to say, we're collecting a lot more in taxes. So where's it going? In our state, um, as I-502 uh, stated in an initiative, this is how things were going to be dispersed. In blue, you had what was gonna be going to our state general fund, and in orange was gonna go to prevention, treatment, education, and research. All the voters were very happy and very supportive of that because that was going to media campaigns, education, awareness, you know, everything that we were supposed to do was supposed to go to that. So in 2016, it was supposed to be the 42.8 million, and then it was supposed to go to 70.3, and then the 86.3 in 2018. However, oh, yes, sir. Can I just back up for one yeah, second? Yeah, absolutely. Just be, it sounded like you were taxing at each transition point 25%. Yes. And then there was a change. Did it just bump up on the end user points in the consumer?
consumer and the rest of the 25% still remains. 25% is gone. So the only people that are getting taxed are the purchasers of marijuana, but the industry does not realize any tax as it grows the marijuana or produces it. Or They're still subjected to like B&O taxes and things of that nature, but when it comes to an excise tax, no. Well, and they are selling to each tier. So What's that? They are selling tier to tier, so I mean, it doesn't go from a, a producer, from a producer to a processor with, without charge. The process is buying it from the producer, and there's some tax associated. But it's not the 37. It's not the excise tax, no. Right. Okay. It's a sales tax per transaction yes. at the state rate. Right? And in King County, that's like 10% right now. Okay. So. Thanks. Yeah. So, as promised in the initiative, you know, everything was supposed to go into treatment prevention research um, as it should. But in initiative processes within Washington State, our state legislature can tincture with that budget scheme after two years. So in 2014, things got switched up. Well, sorry, 2015, things got switched up with the House bill. Now what you're seeing is what was promised in blue to treatment education and prevention is actually now in the orange. Department of Health alone was cut $77 million for what they were going to be doing. Those funds were intended to implement a marijuana hotline and an education campaign for youth and adults. Now, we do have some programs that are still existing within the state. We have a, one that's called Listen to Your Selfie. So it's in a way for kids to promote themselves within their friends and their social groups, you know, to not engage in drugs. And then they have a website and a bunch of media campaigns that way. So there is, there are resources out there. However, not to what was promised. Where it goes. General fund. Shocker. Uh, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So section 10 is our last section, so thank you guys for bearing with me. I appreciate it so far. Um, it, pretty much our section 10 is to assess in our reports what's to come. So when we did our first report, our entire last section was talking about the new way that medical marijuana is going to be implemented within our recreational system. With the second report, since we were already integrated, then we talk about ways that new house bills have been tweaked a little bit. So one of the things that they had passed was Senate Bill 5131. And this was to drastically reduce all the advertising. I mean, those little noodle guys that say marijuana, those were everywhere. Uh, they would light up, they'd have the sign twirlers. There was a guy in Spokane who actually dressed up like a pot leaf and had a little thing. I mean, it was a lot, people were very excited. Uh, but now with this house bill, they can't do that, nor to that capacity. So what you're looking at is that they actually eliminated those sign spinner twirler dudes. You have sandwich boards are now gone, inflatables, the noodle guys that I like to call them, and persons in costume are no longer allowed. What they're restricted to now is they can do signs that are limited to the business or the trade name, trade name business location, identifying the nature of the business. However, they cannot use plants or products or images that are appealing to children. So this is something that is rolling out now um, as it pertains. Now, obviously online, social media platforms, those are still being utilized, but when it comes to billboards and sign twirlers and stuff, things have been drastically cut back. And I'm done talking, now I get to pass it off to this guy. Thank you. Slides. I did want to make a couple of points before we move forward. Neither of us have mentioned, and we should have quite clearly early on, that there is no personal cultivation in Washington State unless you have a medical card. So they're, they're, normal citizens do not grow at home, certainly. And, and that essentially um, is a boost to the industry because there is no competition in folks' homes. Um, secondly, we have seen essentially a net, no net change from there are two systems, gray market, recreational market, to one system that's recreational with a medical aspect to it. Um, our medical system had no registry, uh, no oversight, no taxing, no regulation. We never knew how many green cards were out there. We never knew how many dispensaries were out there. The estimates are anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 dispensaries in Washington State. So doing away with those dispensaries, bringing on 550 retail stores, it's a wash for all intents and purposes. We really haven't seen a change in accessibility and availability in Washington State. What has changed is the percep for perception of harm on the part of kids. When you ask adults, what are the harmful, what are the risks associated with smoking weed? Well, my health, my job, my marriage, my kids, 
that laundry list. You ask a 17-year-old, what is the risk or harm associated with smoking marijuana? Getting arrested. That's it. It starts and stops with it being illegal. That's not the case anymore in Washington State. So that, that admonition is gone. That perception of harm is almost completely impossible to get in any surveys anymore because they just don't believe that it's harmful in their worldviews. So very briefly, this was a survey that was done well after um, the election and as commercialization was finally kind of hitting stride. Um, do you, would you vote again to legalize? Yes, as a matter of fact, Washingtonians would vote more um, supportively than they did before. 53% uh, of us voted for it uh, in 2012. At this survey, 56% of us said, yeah, it's a great idea. Has it changed your use? This is active users. And again, I'm talking about a state that's been up to their earlobes in high quality weed for decades. Um, no, it's not gonna change. It's easier to go to the store. If you, before, if before your access was a friend who was connected to the lap market, and you called him up and said, dude, I, I need an ounce. He's like, I'm sorry, man, I'm taking my, my family to California for two weeks, you're SOL. And you were SOL. Well, now you just go to the store. I mean, no biggs. Um, and it hasn't changed in, uh, in adjusting behavior, much to speak of. By and large, everything's the same. Um, how likely are non-users and very occasional users to change their behaviors now that you can walk into the store? Well, not much. Not really. Um, it, it hasn't been this overwhelming change in behavior or consumption patterns or purchasing. And last but not least, what do you think about legalizing on a national basis? Hell yeah, people in Washington State say, let's just get there. Why are we thinking around a state at a time? We should just legalize it for the entire country and be done with it. So, that's that. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, very interesting. Uh, so I have a question, I guess it has a little bit to do with the, the black market and prices, whether you track prices oh, yeah. in the black market. So I guess my question has to do something to that. Uh, did legalization drive down the prices of the price of the legal weed? And is the black market sensitive to the differential between the legal market and the illegal market? Or are there other drivers or uh, yeah. variables? In fact, the, size the black market is now at about half what it was before in terms of pricing. So before 2012, before the I-502 election, an eighth on the street was about 40 bucks, an eighth of an ounce. Now it's about 20 bucks. And the pricing in the legal system is dropping too as production ramps continues to ramp up, um, as processing is, is now settling in and the stores are now established in their neighborhoods and communities. Uh, and inventory, which was an issue first year or so, is now completely settled. Um, the prices are going down in the legal market and it's had a major effect on the black market. We still have no sense of the scope of the black market and never really have. Um, and the confounding issue for us for years and years and years was this enormous gray market that was called medical marijuana. Yeah. Um, of the 500 stores, 490 of them are also medically endorsed. So essentially both systems are now fully functioning in one mm -hmm. venue, so to speak. Yes, sir. Um, just to answer that question as well, two things. I know if the traces of the day in Washington, everybody knows the prices are really high. But it's been falling pretty consistently. Um, and I think the most recent data has been like $80 a gram. Yeah. Uh, okay. On average. <clears throat> it's about 20% below what was the year before, and I think 20, 25% below the year before that. So I guess it is pretty steady. And I was curious if you see signs of a similar price increase in the. Uh, We're, well, the this doesn't sound like I'm answering your question, but we're beginning to see some leveling off of sales, production. The entire growth of the industry over the course of these last five years seems to be reaching something of a stable point. Um, so most all of these things, I, I assume, will stabilize in turn. So prices are probably pretty close to where they may stay. Uh, it'll be a decision on the part of the Liquor and Cannabis Board in regard to uh, licensing more producers and more processors depending on, depending on demand. But it looks like everything is beginning to stabilize. And we may be at a price point that will continue on for some time now. Yes, sir. Uh, two kind of questions, comments. Uh, I, I still got lost on the math, but I think you got lost on it, uh, which is how you tax at 
35%. Oh, oh. And then you end up with more money just by taxing at 37%. No, actually we don't. Um, we tax the deep producers, 25%. Processors, 25 percent. Yeah. Retailers, 20. So, so the aggregate with all state, and local, and excise together was around 57 percent markup, I think, for a retail purchase. Now it's simply just 37 percent at the retailer for the consumer. So, yeah, we're not generating. Well, this is difficult, but in terms of scale, there weren't enough businesses. There weren't as many businesses then as there are now. So the net change with a, a fully mature system and 1,600 businesses as opposed to a nascent system that had maybe 500 businesses that were being charged 57%. Now we have three times as much business activity going on that's only being charged at 37%. So it's essentially a wash. But, but the early, the, the wholesalers, if you will, are getting out a little cheaper oh, than, hell yeah. than the retailers. Yeah. So what interests me there is the politics that are involved, the new element of politics that has come in to cause that change. I'm sure it wasn't the uh, legislature and the governor who thought, we got to use that one, these guys. Uh, anyway, it, so it was legislators and it was, well, it was, and it was regional, yeah. Eastern Washington and Western Washington, yeah. where the growers are, it's where the processors are. It's their ear that interests me, yeah. not, not yeah. their vote. Uh, but then the other side is then the citizenry not screaming about all that money they got robbed from them uh, from coming into the state coffers, they go to treatment and help them make uh, all your communities a little bit better by helping the people that need help. And all that money from now, three quarters of that money got stolen. More or less. Yeah. It's now it's now just another dollar in the general fund. Yeah. And what's interesting too is Washington is very unique when it comes to media. So Steve and I, I mean, we'll look at media, Seattle Times, Seattle PI, whatever you want to be, anything. Any major news outlet, you don't see anything about marijuana anymore in their news. Even after you know commercialization, there was a big a lot of hoopla. But now you're just seeing more stories on the business industry itself, as opposed to challenges or issues or um, kind of issues that are kind of like formulated or what have been posed. So I'm not sure there's been enough attention given to it for most of Washington residents to be aware. This report had no attention from the media yeah. in Washington State. Um, our, at the, the federal and state level, our politicians will not open their mouth about marijuana. They dare not express any opinion whatsoever. You'll find the mayor of a town of 1500 who's quite vocal about what's going on in this city. You get to Seattle and for the, a succession of four mayors now, they have not made one comment about marijuana ever. They are so afraid of alienating voters that they won't go there. It's not a conversation in Washington. Sir. Two, two quick questions. So you mentioned uh, the confluence of processors and producers. Yes. And my recollection when I-5 was passed was that there was not going to be vertical integration between processors, producers, and retailers. Did the legislature change that, or did uh, LCB change that? So you can hold a producer processor license together. You cannot do it with retail. Retail is a standalone license on their own. They're not allowed to have any um, interest or be involved in like a producer or a processor themselves. Yes, they might pick on who they're going to do business with, but they can't own stock or priority within those other businesses. So it's up to the licensee themselves. If I am a producer and I want to be a processor, that's up to them to make that decision to move forward. And I don't believe any of that language is ever in statute, so it's an issue of rulemaking on the part of the liquor and cannabis. So you can monopolize between producer and processor, but not into the yes. retail level. And you can hold up to, as I think it's three now, retailer three, licenses, yeah. and then they're changing the rules that they haven't already on producers and processors of the number of licenses you're allowed to hold. So there's some mini moguls in the yes. system, but no big corporate entities. And then the other one was just uh, real quick, about a year ago, Seattle Times came out with an estimate for um, the market share. And at that point in time, they said it was roughly a third, so the, the recreational market was about a third of the market, whatever it was, 500 million, you know, let's say that was the number, 500 million is medicinal, and there was an equal amount that was in, still in the black market, which I think correct. Correct. What you're saying, black market is still thriving, yes. um, but do you see a trend one way or the other in that relationship? 
Well, they're in interesting little tiny artifacts. Like, we're not seeing BHO lab blow up anymore because that was all feeding the medical side of things, the dispensaries. Now the, the licensed processors do all of that um, under the auspices of a fully licensed activity. So the, the incentive to be cooking BHO in your basement is basically gone in Washington State, unless you're, it's for private use. Um, so, and there are so little artifacts about um, trafficking and the black market activity, and, and there's still a lot of questions in regard to how many of the guys who were growing in their backyard for a dispensary are now growing for the black market as, because they're, they're shut out of the legal, the recreation system. So lots of variables in play. Um, and with shifting demand issues and pricing issues and lots of other things, it's anyone's guess, I think, at this point. Uh, I mean, we know the gray market is gone, yeah, but we have no idea what the market share in the part of two entities is compared to the, what we knew about the market share with those three entities before. Like if no one knows it's 50-50, 60-40, how much illicit activity is actually still going on out there. So, uh, what, what's your perception of the influence of the industry to lobbyists and campaign contributions? They're active. For, for all of us who are coming, since we're just starting out, is there anything that maybe could have... Could yeah, have um, one of the things that our Liquor and Cannabis Board, one of the very intelligent decisions they made was to not allow the industry to have a seat at the table. The industry has no, other than hearings, once the rules are proposed, public hearings. They're not there in the rule development process. They're not there helping staff um, interpret what the legislature intended in, in the statute in RCW. So there wasn't that voice for profit and expansion that there is in other states. Um, again, home growths, I think, make an enormous difference in, in, in our state compared to other states. Um, we were lucky on the one hand, we are smart on the other hand. Um, <laughs> lucky that our medical marijuana system was in such complete and total disarray that it wasn't worth trying to say. <laughs> um, and we did, and we were unusual in that sense. And we did not build on a creaky medical system. We basically just tore it down and started over, huh. which is working way in the back. Yes. How do you know? Do you know if any of the states that the state of Washington is outside the state? What's going outside the state? Do you know any of the production? If no, not definitively. If I had to guess, I would have to say that over 80% of the diverted weed is black market weed. Um, the typical purchase now, this is anecdotal, I know three owners. <coughs> the typical purchase is one joint or maybe an eighth of an ounce. But people are not walking in rec uh, marijuana stores and buying a pound. Um, if you're at that level in terms of your use or your business, you're probably still connected to the black market. And I, I have a very strong feeling that that's much more fluid and much more active. And there's much more serotipitous activity going on than we can even be aware of at this point. I'd be really surprised if anybody bothered to go to a recreational store and then drive to Montana or Wyoming with it. It's only worth it if you've got pounds. And you can only get pounds if you're connected to the black market, frankly. Yes? Yes, from the Office of National Drug Control Policy. And the data that you guys get, is that based on voluntary agreement, or are they required to... That's, it's archival public data. Yeah, I mean, we have to ask the Poison Center, for instance, and a few other entities um, for specific data or stuff that they don't routinely release publicly. But 98% um, of it's... Any one of you could write this report if you knew where to look. Um, we didn't have to gin up anything. Sir. Yeah, just uh, two questions real quick. Uh, ownership of uh, growing facilities, is that primarily in-state ownership? Is it out-of-state ownership? Are you looking in state. at that? In-state. There, there are very strong, very strong language in regard to out-of-state out interests. So, so the out-of-state is, is more or less prevented from owning? More or less. More, I mean, obviously, you, there's no for us. And then my next question is, I keep hearing about the, uh, was it liquor and cannabis? Board. It sounds to me like, I'm a listener from Utah, it sounds to me like they have a, a very, very wide rulemaking authority. Yes. And that they really kind of run the whole show. Yes, they're also the enforcement body. 
and they're the enforcement body. Yeah, they've got a hundred guys. And they're put in place by appointment, they're not elected, right? Uh, they are appointed by the governor. Okay, and, and so the legislature, again, as you said, they kind of, other than they change tax policy, they're kind of taking a hands off. Uh, they, they can take your life with the advertising business is upcoming, I mean, no more weekly guys and that kind of stuff. The legislature took that action. Um, the, the Liquor Cannabis Board is in a position where they're either interpreting or implementing statute and rule that was promulgated by the legislature. And, and enforcing those laws. Yeah, and yes, and enforcing them. They've got a hundred guy um, enforcement team, essentially. So blue and, blue and whites, um, sheriffs and chiefs aren't really in the marijuana enforcement business at all. Unless it's trafficking on a very large scale. Scary. Or, yeah, it is. <laughs> Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention.